With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to take something that is really, really loud. We're going to turn the noise down on it. going to get to an aspect of it that a lot of people just kind of skipped over that I think needs to be paid attention to. We're going to talk about these Martha Vineyard flights. We're going to talk about these buses going to D.C. We're going to talk immigration, we're talk migrants, we're going to talk refugees and asylum seekers. This is the guy we want to talk to it about, another of our great Young Voices contributors. He's a political science guy. Daniel Chang Contreras, how are you, my friend? Thank you so much for the time today. Oh, thank you, Andrew, for having me. I'm doing great. All right. You're in D.C. right now because you're studying one of them prestigious university things that, you know, us community college kids, they didn't want to talk to us, but that's okay. (laughs) Uh, I went back later online. Um, You're in D.C. Let's start there because this feels like there's a couple different narratives going here at one. One of them is the D.C. national media political commentary at bubble narrative. You can probably speak to that because you're in D.C. right now. Then there's the wider nation looking at it from afar. And then there's the people actually involved in these things. Let's take those separately. Let's start with the D.C. narrative. You're in D.C. You're talking to these people. You're on a university campus. Start there when this story hit with the Martha's Vineyard and then shipping folks to uh, Naval Conservatory. That's the vice president's residence. Start there with this story, how it hit you when you found out about it over the weekend. Uh, well, so I found out, uh, I found out about most of the other things on Twitter. And uh, so the, the DC mi- uh, narrative is basically as you expect. Um, it's basically portraying Governor Ron DeSantis, Governor Abbott, uh, in this case, Abbott, because Abbott sent the, the migrants to DC specifically, which had sent the Santa send them to Marshall's Vineyard as playing with immigrants as political pawns, as being particularly cruel. Uh, saying that, of course, Martha's Vineyard or Washington, D.C., New York, et cetera, they don't have the capacities to deal with migrants. These, actually, this issue has been going for a while, as we all know. Actually, Major, uh, Major Muriel Bowser has called the National Guard for a while to try to deal with migrants. So that's a narrative, basically, uh, painting, of course, Governor Ron DeSantis and Governor Abbott as using immigrants as political pawns to get uh, better points with the Republican base and trying to basically tease off uh, the Democrats and and in DC and uh, in blue cities. That's like the media narrative itself, which is like the narrative that we've been he- hearing all around um, since these flights and, and bus- buses started going on. Okay, let's break a couple of those things down, though, because there's no version of this from any side where this isn't using people for political gains. Like, that's just the base. There, there's no yeah. version of this where they're not using these people. So everybody's being disingenuous on that. Yeah. I don't think it's gaining us anything to parse out who's being the le- least in- disingenuous and who's being the most useful for these pawns. So I want to bring it to you this way. I heard very few people talking about who these people actually were other than just the average. Some of them got specific and said, well, they're asylum seekers. Most people just said they're migrants or immigrants or illegal immigrants. Pick your poison with that. I heard very few people talking about who these people actually are. So let's start where we talked about. There's different narratives going here. Who were the actual people being used in these stunts? And they are stunts, even if you yeah. agree with it. It's a stunt. Yeah, yeah. I think this is an important piece of this discussion because who they're using was not accidental, but nobody's talking about who these people as a people group specifically is. But you know who these folks are, don't you? Of course. They're Venezuelans. Um they're Venezuelans, they're, uh, I'm Venezuelan as well. I know the situation uh, of Venezuelan migrants as any uh, of my compatriots know. And it has been a situation that is one of the worst humanitarian crises in the Western Hemisphere over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and it's basically the United States has been coming into this cr- crisis, the refugee crisis, the Venezuelan refugee crisis late in the game. Uh, you guys, because of course, geogra- uh, geographically, are uh, quite quite a far uh, far from the United from Venezuela, haven't really suffered it in many ways. But now, 
uh, you know, it has come into effect. It has come in, and 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 now the Venezuelan crisis has come into the United States. The reality of this is that while we talk about uh, asylum seekers, while we talk about Venezuelan migrants as if this were as if were any other nationality, as we're talking about Salvadorians, Nicaraguans, Guatemalans, etc., the reality is the Venezuelan crisis is very, very different. It's very specific as well. It's a very it has a political origin, and Republicans know this because they've telling they've been telling this for for years. And Democrats try to ignore it in some regards because of some ideological issues. But the, the reality is that the Venezuelan crisis has left a 6.8 million people fleeing the country since 2017, 2018. Um, that's almost a quarter of the country in just four or five years have left Venezuela because of the socialist pol policies of Nicolás Maduro. And a majority of people actually haven't gone to the United States, right? I mean, a lot of people may say, may say oh, why are they coming here? Majority of Venezuelans have left to Colombia, to Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, uh, Panama, they actually even left to Trinidad and Tobago in the, in rafts as well. So Venezuelans are leaving the country in a, an astonishing rate. This is like, imagine like 25% of America left in four years. That's the, the magnitude of the, the issue we're talking about here. And those are the people that are being bossed to Washington, D.C. They're being bossed to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and as you said, yeah, U.S. has political stunts. To be fair, um, many of these people use this probably this bus to get to new york to get to washington dc and from then they'll go other where uh, other place where they have some family and friends and they can like settle in um that's most likely the, uh, that not what they will do but the reality is that the united states is now facing the reality of the venezuelan refugee crisis and instead of having an appropriate policy response we are trying to include the Venezuelan crisis within the uh, broader themes of immigration and the broader, politi broader political um, fights between Democrats and Republicans on immigration, what, which I would think it's actually uh, both not correct in a moral term and also it's not even, not even good in a policy term because the uh, root problems are very different. And one of those root problems, uh, Daniel Chan Contreras joining us. Here, here's one of the root problems we don't talk about. Everybody understands that the southern border is a mess. Like everybody knows that's a problem. The problem is, too, you have to parse out who's down there. And we don't do that. We just broad brush it. Like we say, well, because you say illegal immigrants on the southern border, everybody immediately starts thinking, well, probably Mexicans or other South Americans, but primarily Mexican, Hispanic thing. How are these Venezuelans that are coming into America, getting to the southern border, asking for asylum and then getting bussed and or flown somewhere else? We're just picking on the last part of that. If you go look at a map, that's a freaking journey. It they're is. not they're not walking that. There's ways that they're having to get there. That is a trek. It is dangerous. You've wrote about this before. And it was funny because you re-upped your piece on this and, and we'll link to it in the show notes. Go read it for yourself. And you're like. This was horrible, and this was two years ago, and it's even gotten worse. Yeah. Why Why does that part matter? Because people are like, well, they're coming illegally, so it doesn't matter. No, it does matter because when they're seeking asylum, that's a legal definition. That's a specific process, and understanding what they go through to get here is part of what they can argue when they seek asylum, isn't it? Yes, yes, and that's really important what you point out. Um, I, I understand the temptation of saying, oh, illegal immigrants, they all speak Spanish. They're probably from Mexico or uh, the Northern Triangle. They're really close. They just cross Mexico and that's it. The reality is very different. As you said, Venezuela is far from the south southern border. It's extremely far. It's not something that you do like in a, in a regular basis, right? It's actually you not know, something that we did, like Venezuelans did historically. It's something that has... Uh, it's a phenomenon that has appeared over the last couple of years, actually, because the situation in Venezuela and back home is really bad. That's why it's happening. It's not like historically Venezuelans go to appear in the Rio Grande and, and claim for asylum. No, actually, right? In 2019, in fiscal year 2019, 2020, it's like 5,000 encounters. Now we have 155,000 encounters on this fiscal year, and it hasn't ended yet. So the numbers are quite substantial. And what they do now, what, what Venezuelans do, when I wrote the piece that you referenced, 
usually Venezuelans did get into Mexico by plane and then they trekked through Mexico, uh, basically being at the mercy of the cartels and coyotes and all that. But today, most Venezuelans don't do that because uh, thanks to Biden, by the way, Mexico imposed really severe visa restrictions on Venezuelans to avoid Venezuelans getting to the south southern border. And that didn't work out. What it did was that Venezuelans are now going through the Darien Gap, which is a very uh, remote jungle between uh, Colombia and Panama. They trekked that, uh, that gap where a lot of people died. This is really, 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 really grisly, really bad things happening to the rain gap. We're talking about uh, people dying of uh, dehydration, people dying of exhaustion, people being uh, killed, people being uh, subjected to torture by cartels and criminals and all that and gangs. They cross through the rain gap and they then walk all the way up uh, to towards uh, the Rio Grande. And by the way, this is not the only route of migrants, of Venezuelan migrants walking uh, until they get the destinations. This type of route also happened a couple of years before, but it wasn't to the United States, it was to Peru, it was to Chile. Uh, it was more in the, in the southern continent. So what I want, really want to point out here, and to especially to American audience, this is not something that all oh, the United States is, why are we picking all the Venezuelan immigrants? Why are they coming here? The, the United States is just the last country on the large list that is suffering the effects of the uh, humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. It has been going on for, for a long while in South America, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Argentina, they can talk about it. And now the United States is just another name into the list. Just the United States just got caught, on, caught off guard. Yeah, Daniel Chan Contreras joining us. All right, here's where this gets sticky. So they go through this process, and this is the same for all asylum seekers and people that are trying to get to the border to get some kind of legalization process going because that's something else that gets lumped in. It's like, hey, some of those folks are coming to the border. They're coming to places. They're told that this is where you go to try to get into the country. That's what they're told, whether it's true or not. That's what they're being told. So they get to the border, and they start trying to seek asylum or claim asylum. And to do that, because the way the laws are written, you have to be on U.S. soil to claim U.S. asylum. Yeah, that's where this gets really messy. These people now, again, like you just said, they've been trekking through the jungle. They've been, you know, low cost airlines. And then however they can get to the border, they get to the border sometimes by very, you know, malicious means that we'll deal with some other time. If they don't have a good information and we don't have a good coherent policy, like you said, you know, the, the Trump administration had one policy, Biden had an administration. They've been in court working on the Trump administration policy. When Trump came in, he was in court trying to fix the Obama era policy. We do not have coherent policy. Let's just lay that out. Whether you like it or not, it's not coherent. So all these folks are being told is come to the border, get your feet on U.S. soil and ask for asylum. Mm -hmm. That's what they're told. So when they get to the border, that's when this starts getting really, really messy, not just humanitarian, but legally it's messy because a lot, even the American experts on immigration argue over what actually is the process right now right yeah that's correct um as you as you said uh the united i would say it's not that we have uh, the united states doesn't have a coherent policy I, sometimes the police doesn't have any policy um the Biden administration has done some basic some things to steam basically the the the, the flow of my of venezuelan refugees trying to take asylum in the united states it hasn't really worked it has implemented tps but that tps doesn't cover people who came uh, the most, the majority of people who came through the border, and of course, as you said, a lot of the Venezuelan migrants that come here, they uh, go to the U.S. or they claim asylum, and the asylum process is broken in many ways. Uh, taking to one uh, one asylum case can, you know, uh, before it actually gets heard and it actually gets decided, it can be years in the making, right? It can be a long time before a court actually decides what it will if the asylum seeker. Uh, gets asylum or not and of course people come here in the meantime they got some work permits and they can try to uh rehash their life for a while so of course the united states the combination of uh humanitarian catastrophe in venezuela and a lack of policy a clear policy on the venezuelan issue on the venezuelan migratory issue as the united states uh, it has created this situation and by the way let me i will repeat this again it's not like is not something new. The United States should have known that this was coming because Colombia has been facing this for years now. Um, Peru and all the countries in South America, apparently. But of course, uh, policymakers sometimes think that anything below the Rio Grande sometimes really doesn't exist. Uh, and now the chickens have come to roost. Of course, the United States will be suffering from the, I want to say even suffering, being affected by the refugee crisis of Venezuela. And unless Democrats or Republicans get their uh, act together, this will continue going on without 
um, a clear legal and policy um, policy procedures to get this done. Yeah, Daniel Chan Contreras joining us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, uh, come back. We're going to talk about why the Venezuelan folks were the ones being used for these political stunts. Going to talk about how that played off, the ins and outs of some of the tricky parts that the media skipped over. We're going to talk about the people side of this as well, not just the policy side. Daniel Chan Contreras joins us as we continue on Hard Tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, we got Daniel Chan Contreras. We're talking the uh, immigrant. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what we need an overarching term for this because we had the Martha Vineyard part, we got the bus part, we got the vice president house part, we got the New York part, the DC part. In that part of the problem, though, is because this thing unthreads so many different ways and the stunts become the thing. And then that's all anybody ever talks about. And now they're, you know, here in another day or two, everybody will forget about it and move on. Like you said, though, this is a constant problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, as according to Border Patrol, 50,499 encounters were from Venezuelans in fiscal year 21, 155,553 this fiscal year, which hasn't ended. And we already have approximately 300,000 Venezuelans who have requested uh, temporary protective status. It is a ongoing problem, and it's an ongoing problem that has been caused by the Venezuelan situ the political situation back home, back in Venezuela. And this is something, by the way, which I think, Andrew, is really important to, to, to point out here, <clears throat> and one of the things that really concerns me uh, is the way Republicans have been framing the issue in Venezuelans. Because, of course, since these stunts are made to highlight the problem of the border, which is a, it's a disaster, and of course, to highlight hypocrisy of Democrat majors and all that, which I understand it's a political ploy that's a fair many points. The problem here is that we are now, Republicans are now confounding the Venezuelan issue with illegal immigrants, right? After years of them being, of they saying, oh, the Venezuelan situation is so bad, communism is so bad, socialism is so bad, this is what socialism causes to a country, it destroys a country, and the Venezuelan people are now suffering from it. And that was all good, all good or great, and actually it was true and, and empathetic. And they say somehow say the same thing about Cubans. Cubans are not uh, refugees, are not illegal immigrants, are refugees because they, they're escaping a communist dictatorship. Oh, but the Venezuelans who are ox who are also being ruled by a similar uh, dictatorship, they are illegal immigrants just because, of course, the ploy requires them to be illegal immigrants, right? So that's what actually concerns me quite a lot. That the Republican Party, who has been quite consistent on the way that characterized the Venezuelan crisis, now in these moments, because of course the political necessities dictate in that way, they change a little bit the tune. It's like, oh, Venezuelans are no longer, uh, you know, like kind of victims of communism. They're more another illegal immigrants are coming to the country. That's something that I consider it's uh, worrisome as a, as a Venezuelan and as a conservative as well. Here's the thing. Let's be adults here. When whoever planned this for, and I know DeSantis and Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis, they're getting the flack because these are their programs. They pro they didn't handpick these folks. Somebody in their chain of command and their staffs did this. Somebody purposefully said, let's get the Venezuelans for this. They did that purposefully. They didn't get, you know, folks from any other country. They didn't use uh, Mexicans. They didn't use any other group. I know it's speculation. I don't think that's accidental. It can't be accidental of all the folks down there. They know the asylum process is more legally fraught. They know it's more complicated. They know that the uh, the situation of these folks is a little different. Why did they pick the Venezuelan folks for this, do you think? Because it's happened more than once now, so it's not accidental. Yeah, yeah it's happened in a while. I mean, actually, the majority of people being bust around, it's not like only Martha's Vineyard or the vice president's home. It's like majority of them are Venezuelans. Uh, I wouldn't know, and as you said, it's a speculative. I don't know the inner and outs and like the process it works, but my working theory is basically most Venezuelans who cross the border immediately ask for asylum. I mean, they cross the border and immediately ask for asylum because that's the way that that migratory flow is working, right? So when when, when you ask for asylum, of course, you have to report to, to government, basically. Right? You have to report to uh, border agents. You have to report to immigration officers in some ways. That makes the Venezuelan pool of, uh, of 
of migrants or refugees easier to detect, basically, than those from other countries that don't try to uh, claim asylum and try to actually uh, go into the country without being caught by migrant, um, immigration officers. That's what I think, first one. And the second one, of course, as you said, the situation is quite fraught. In Venezuelans, we are very new at this, uh, at trying to get this, uh, um, trying to get, uh, of crossing the border. This is not a history of Venezuelan crossing the U.S. border. So, of course, people who come here can be easily dissuaded to try to go and pick a bus, maybe it works for them, actually. Maybe they want to go to New York, whatever. The situation is fraught. A lot of them probably don't know a lot of English. And, you know, it's a, a bit easier to get them to uh, uh, to agree. Probably a lot of them do agree and just want to go further north. And, like, they say, okay, I'll pick the free the free ride. So I think it's a combination of both factors. One, that the Venezuelan pool is easier to detect. That's my working theory. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not true. It's just completely speculative. And the second one is, of course, the situation is a little bit more fraud. A lot of Venezuelans, it's the first time they're doing from the United States. They don't have a lot of people who are trying to. It's just not a history, right, of Venezuelans trying to cross into the United States through the Rio Grande. So it's easier for them to um, believe anything, really, what they, they're told. The sad truth of this, um, Daniel Chan Contreras joining us. The sad truth of this is I think everybody got what they wanted out of this episode, the Martha's Vineyard episode. You know, this Governor DeSantis, he got his national pub. The anti-immigration folks got to throw a big fit. The pro-immigration fans got to say, oh, look how well we treated these people before we you know, shipped them off to Cape Cod, which, by the way, that's that's been a refugee place for years and years and years. That's 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 exactly where you put somebody like that. So that was all noise, too, by the way. Um, what do we do now? Because everybody got what they wanted out of this story. This is going to happen again. They're going to oh, keep yeah. doing this. Everybody, both sides. They're going to keep doing yeah, yeah, this yeah. because everybody got what they wanted out of it. So what do we do next time? Because there's going to be a next time. Well, that's that's something that really concerns me is the fact that it will continue happening. Venezuelans are now now part of the American political game, sometimes very to political toxic game of between Democrats and Republicans. And there will not be a policy. And that's something that I said in a in Twitter thread. It was in Spanish, but I'll try to translate it. The fact that this Martha's Vineyard episode, beside the hypocrisy of both parties and all that shows that there is a lack of policy, a lack of coherent policy by the United States government to attend the biggest humanitarian crisis in the Western Hemisphere. And it will continue going on this way. You will see more buses going being shipped to uh, Washington, to New York, to other blue cities. Blue cities will, you know, do a photo up and say, we treated them well and they shipped them off. Um, but the reality is that Venezuelans will still be the victim after this. I mean, the consequences of this is that Venezuelan asylum seekers do not have, there's not a policy to uh, take care of the Venezuelan refugee problem. And now that it's become politicized, there's even less chances for there to be a coherent policy response to the Venezuelan refugee crisis. A crisis that, and I really want to really point this out again and again and again and again, is not a unique American situation. It has been going on in the entire continent for years. 6.8 million people in the last four to five years, that's a quarter of the population. That's like 80 to 90 million Americans left in four years. That's the, the, the situation. That's the, uh, it is almost at the same size as the Ukraine and the Syrian refugee crisis without a war. That's the size of the problem we're talking about. Americans only get the little bit of it four years later, and it, got, um, it caught the American government and the political establishment uh, off guard. Yeah. Um, to put a bow on this, you tweeted about this. Extensively. I'm going to paraphrase and condense this because this Twitter thread was in Spanish and a lot of us don't hobble. So you tell me if I'm wrong on any of this, <laughs> but I'm going to try to paraphrase some of what you were getting to. And basically what you started driving at, because you started getting pushback on Twitter and you started responding to it. A lot of the same tropes we hear about the Southern border is like, oh, well, Venezuelans, they're just sending us, you know, they're emptying their prisons and sending us all their bad folks or, and then you went, and this one really hit me because I think you're right. I think this is going to happen. I'm going to quote you here, and this is the Google Translate. So if it's a little off, you tell me. <laughs> but it, it said, in two years, you're going to see Republicans. And again, they've always said, these are communist refugees. We need to help these people. What's going on in Venezuela? Correctly, what's going on in Venezuela is a humanitarian tragedy. This was one of the richest nations in the world through uh, natural resources and other ways, and they completely wrecked the economy in basically one decade. You said several Republicans, you're going to start seeing them say, well, Venezuela isn't really that bad, that it's been fixed. Why not just make them all go back? I'm afraid you're right, but I'm afraid you're right because we're starting to hear that about Cuba. We've started to hear that about 
other places that uh, legal immigrants even come to. There's this real hardcore wing, and it's always been there. You can go back to the 1880s and see the exact same propaganda of, well, you're native born or you need to go back, that kind of garbage. I think you're right because we've seen this over and over again all throughout American history where you have this anti le And again, I'm not talking about illegal immigration, which is a problem that needs to be dealt with. Legal immigration, asylum seekers, refugees that we probably should be doing some kind of accommodation for. I think you're right to say that. What are you watching for in the next, you know, like we said, they're going to keep doing these events. What are you watching for in the next few years that are going to be warning signs that the tide like that is turning? Well, I think one of the most important things to note will be the way and the narrative that turns the uh, that Republican and conservative media outlets use to describe the Venezuelan situation, right? Until now, until a couple of months, it was always, Venezuela was used as a talking point for a campaign speech saying, this is what socialism does. It's really bad. People are fleeing for their lives or escaping a communist regime, which is all true. But if that tone, when they talk about Venezuela changes from, this is an example of what socialism can do to, oh, look, this is another example of what Biden failed immigration policy has done. And they're bringing uh, criminals and all that. There's this Breitbart report that uh, came out saying about talking about that, which I think is really inconsistent and intrinsic. If this is the new talking point when they talk about Venezuela, just the migratory issue and completely forget the root cause of the problem, which is communism, socialism, if that's going on, then I'm afraid the Republican uh, talking points and the Republican rhetoric on Venezuela will change drastically and will go on and will, they will just simply lump it in as if it was another immigration problem of, like, I don't know, Mexico and, and El Salvador or Guatemala or whatever. Yeah, and this is a problem, whether it's immigration, education, spending, whatever. When you start lumping things into buzzwords, you don't get any kind of good policy out of that because these things are complicated and you got to turn the noise down. That's why I have people like you on my friend, Daniel Chan Contreras, joining us. Uh, till we get you back, I'm going to have you back because we're going to keep talking about this. This is going to continue to be an issue, unfortunately, for the Venezuelan people. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you, what you got going on. We're going to, we got your social media up on the screen. Let folks know what you got going on until they see you on Hertel again, my friend. Uh, yeah, you can uh, you guys can follow me on, on Twitter. Um, I usually post my thoughts over there, both in, in Spanish and English. And also write for El American, which is a conservative media outlet aimed at, at Hispanics. I occasionally write there. So anything that I post, I'll post it over there. Great job, buddy. Good information. We're going to keep talking about this because this stuff is complicated. And until you get into the little nitty gritty details of it, that's why our policies fail, because everybody wants to pick out their one tree in the forest, cut it down and then think the problem solved. That's not how these things work. And we need to focus on these as people problems first and then the policy will follow. Daniel Chan Contreras, love talking. Good time. We'll do it again real soon, sir. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played.